We got high side, low side, specialization of motorcycles. Scene one. Why take do you have one. to sit that close? You don't have to. You're just. You're. That's optional. But you're doing. I like it. how he leans in, but bends his arms. Mmm. Take one. Howdy. Welcome back to another episode of High Side, Low Side. I'm Lem, joined today by Spurge Hello. and Joe. Hi. And today we have a topic on deck that affects each and every motorcyclist, and that's the topic of specialization. We're talking about bike segmentation today. Now this is going to affect. Whoa, I think, whoa, before we dive right in, I know in. the podcast. Yeah, let me, let me finish announcing. No, it. You gotta so jump excited. right in and stick into the podcast. <laughs> so, so this excited. is going to affect each and every one of us, of course, because really that segmentation affects all of us throughout history. Depends really the when your bike is from, when your motorcycle actually hails from. Um, you know, I think is really going to determine how how into this topic you might just be. Now let Spurgeon please tell you about the podcast. I already did. There's a podcast. <laughs> Wherever you get your podcast. Just type in Revzola High Side, Low Side, and you can check us out wherever you go in whatever vehicle you're on. Man, you guys are on point already. <laughs> okay, we've got now, now specialization. Just before we kind of jump into the whole thing, let me just get like a quick couple sentences from you uh, on specialization. H how much differentiation between models is enough? How much is too much? I is this is this segmentation we're seeing helping or hurting? I think things? all motorcycles are special. <laughs> is that is that, yeah, is that, special, is, that is that what we're talking about? Or I mean. I think I think when we look at specialization, um, what really what we're talking about is, you know, it used to be more like you had one bike and you kind of fine tuned it a little bit to do what you wanted to do. Um, and what we're really seeing is that motorcycle manufacturers are taking that job away from the consumer. They're giving you uh, a bike for every possible specific little task out there, um, and that's to me a good thing and a bad thing depending on how you want to look at it. And I don't want to dive too far into it, but I think that. You know, this could be perceived on, on either side. Honestly, he, man, hasn't, taken, he hasn't taken a stand. It's getting. I've learned from previous episodes <laughs> that to take a stand gets pretty aggressive pretty quickly. So it's, I'm just I'm slowly easing into this. It's getting kind of crazy. Um, you know, I'm not. I haven't really been shopping for a, a new bike in the past couple of weeks or whatever. So you know, I, <laughs> I checked out um, all like the big fours website recently. Checked out Honda site real quick. They offer something called a Neo Sports Cafe. That's pretty wild. A mini moto. All right, we kind of, that makes sense. So the way you're looking at that is more specialization of like what these segments well, are being called. If you're looking at it from a, a new rider standpoint, and you're like, mm, I'm interested in buying a motorcycle, and then you go to Cowie's website and you see sport, super sport, hyper sport, mini naked, super naked, retro sport, like right. It's so getting that's crazy. So, so that's more of the segments, right? So. They have there's this hyper segmentation, but also when you look at a specialization within those segments, like if you had a Honda's website, I think they have 13, 12 or thirteen somewhere around there motorcycles under five hundred cc's. So you're so you're now taking that too, and like it's not just like oh well this is your beginner option. Mm -hmm. You now have thirteen beginner options to choose from. Yeah, he's, and he's I just want to point out he has taken a stand at this point. No, 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 no. So, hang, I'm but, hang, just, but, hang, just, but give me just your quick there, summary. Baby. So all, all the all the segmentation, helping or hurting? Um, both. It's doing both at the same time. Also not taking a stand. Yeah, it's, it's, okay. <laughs> but I think you really, and again, as we get into this, I, I think it can be beneficial and it can also be um, I think it's more uh, beneficial to people that are already into it. I think it's a little bit um, confusing to new riders. Okay. But I think it can also benefit new riders. So that's the thing is I, I would agree with Joe that I do think that for enthusiasts like ourselves, having this hyper segmentation allows us to really fine pick what we want to buy. We are apparently very confused and but, we are experienced but, motorcyclists. Well, well, well no, I, I don't think, I mean, I think it only gets confusing when you start, re like when you look at like, um, go ahead, I'll, I'm going to stop for a second because I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep running and I'm going to, I want you to ask the question because well, normally I get, I get yelled at for jumping we'll, ahead we'll in the questions. We'll come back to some of this. Let's, let's move this out of the way here. Uh, all right. So, you know, you had kind of touched earlier on, on the manufacturers taking over sort of some of that um, customization aspect. So, so what burden of modification do you guys feel falls to the rider, uh, you know, as far as making a motorcycle suitable for a particular purpose? And so I guess sub-question from that, too, what part do dealers play in that recipe, and, and how has that changed over the years? You want to go first? You want me to go? Uh, I'll start. I have a Tiger from 2012. We talk about that bike pretty frequently. Um, when I got that bike, they offered the roadie version and the off-roadie version. Mm -hmm. So that determined wheel size and style. 
the next generation started offering um, like luggage and crash protection and lights, you know, aftermarket lights and all this stuff, factory aftermarket things. Sure. So it was kind of like for the guy who wanted an adventure bike but didn't want to have to go through figuring out like which crash bars are the best or which luggage fits and doing all that crap himself, he could just buy that bike from the dealership already decked out ready to rip. Is that stuff really that difficult to figure out though? No, but I think that for I think it some, depends on the bike. I think some folks really dig personalizing their bike with the accessories, and some people just want to get on it and take a trip and not have to mess with it. So take a t- take it. Let's take a trip back in time to the '70s, right? Take um, us back, Spurge. And <laughs> you know, you back. look at the Goldwing. When the Goldwing was introduced, it was really just a big standard motorcycle. Mm-hmm. It didn't come with luggage. It didn't come with a fairing. You had to buy all that stuff and right. add it on. Mm-hmm. Throughout time what the OEMs realize is they can make a lot more money if they just offer these packages with the luggage included or with the fairing already on there. Uh, And and that's where we've eventually just evolved to the point where we're at today. Now, I do think that the OEMs take some of that responsibility on and they're going to say, hey, we're going to offer you uh, the up-level package of the adventure bike that already includes the bags. Or we're going to have the bags and you can just purchase them and they clip right on. The mounts are already there. You just Mm -hmm. clip the bag on if you want the Mm -hmm. bags. Um, where I think the onus falls back on the consumer a little bit more is if you want to go with um, a, a naked sport bike because you're really just using it around town most of the time, but then maybe you want to take it out on a trip. Um, for me with my Bonneville, right? Like they don't have easy luggage options for that. I had to find throwover luggage or, or tank bags and I had to figure out what luggage worked and to bolt a little windscreen on. So I think, I think a lot of people out there can pick their poison. Um, if you know that you're going to be doing a lot of traveling, you know that certain things are important to you, you can get a bike that's already pre-set up that's really easy to modify, or you can get a bike that you really just like the way it performs, you like the way it looks, but then you've got to figure out how to make it work for those other scenarios where it's not really designed to work. So I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second here. Please for bo- do. For, for both of you guys. So, I, I, you know, the, the you discussed the manufacturer sort of making these options available for people um, who aren't interested in becoming an amateur your motorcycle mechanic and I grasp that what what role does the dealer play here I mean I would make the argument that for the for the person who wants to set up a bike exactly as they want it set up right you go to the aftermarket catalog you go to the parts catalog etc you buy your stuff you bolt it up you're good to go where you go to revzilla.com or, 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 <laughs> we, we do like shameless over there. play right there <laughs> right, so just plug that real hard um no but in all seriousness like in my mind part of part of the part of the sort of the, the ingredients that the that the dealer is supposed to bring to the recipe is that ability for, for you to walk up to the parts counter and say like hey i want to do this thing with this motorcycle what do you got for me i think and, and neither of you guys mentioned that i think it depends i think it's a cash on grab. The dealer like <laughs> no 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 I, I i think it depends on the dealership and it depends on the modification you're talking about right so if you're talking about can the dealer like walk you through the parts catalog and say hey like there's this luggage option available would you like us to buy that for you yeah. i think most dealerships can handle that when you're looking at like us modifying dirt bikes right like part of the reason that I went with a KTM dirt bike recently when I bought a dirt bike, part of the reason that Joe did is that we, have, we got a new KTM dirt bike I into, the, into the discussion. I wasn't going to say it. I wasn't going to say it. But I, I think that the reason that we both decided to go with KTM over like Honda um, is because the, the local dealership, Solid Performance, is fantastic. They can modify anything we want however we want. Whereas like the big four dealerships, like – I can't tell you the last time I walked in and they're like there to support the technical side of modifying a bike to the nth degree. But I, I mean, I, I, you're, I feel like you're almost making my point there is that you you chose uh, apparently that dealer because they're willing to, to change the bike up for you. Well, that's the, but that it's, it's, want, it depends on what modifications you're talking about. Right. So for that kind of riding for my dirt riding for that bike, I did choose based on the dealership. For something that would be more of like a street-based motorcycle, I, that has no consideration for me whatsoever because I can make those modifications myself. Why is the manufacturer hyper-segmenting these bikes if there is a dealer network that should, in theory, you know, be, be doing some of these things? I, I, guess that, I guess that's what I'm asking is where does, where does the factory's job end and the dealer take over? Well, to, so I to think that's guys? a bigger question as far as dealer networks in America and what is the responsibility of the OEMs to actually support the dealer? I think some manufacturers have gotten better with it as far as offering training and such, but to modify bikes and take them from X and make it into a completely different bike, I don't think most of the dealerships have the resources to to do that. Um, I think that 
to have a dealership that's really good at modification and really good at changing a bike around completely is is hard to find. And when you find one, you support them and you trust them. Um, but also, like, I'm not walking into solid performance and saying, like, hey, take this street bike and make it into a dirt bike for me, which is what we saw back in the 60s and 70s. Like, they're taking an already pretty great dirt bike and they're just fine tuning it for my rider weight and, and my style and, and the performance that I'm looking for. They're not making a whole new machine for me. Yeah. The bikes um, are much closer to what the rider wants in the end so that, you know, accessorizing really isn't that big of a task at this yeah, point. Yeah. And I think that's the key, right? Like you're talking like accessory, like adding the accessories you want to make a motorcycle more capable is different than this like specialization and segmentation that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Like taking a naked sport bike and saying, Hey, I want to do some lightweight touring with this. Okay. I can add some bags. Um, but I think it's more about the fact that like, what do you choose at point of purchase? Do I go with a naked sport bike or do I go with an adventure bike mm -hmm. or do I go with a touring bike? There's a well, lot of what, overlap. Well, there's a lot of overlap. The adventure bike segment has gotten so great. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you really want to go sport touring, like most of the adventure bikes out there will sport tour the <laughs> out of you. Um, <laughs> but like, they can also go off road, just not as good as a dirt bike. Like, I think that should be a t-shirt. Yeah, I've first. been I'm so pretty sure sport tour the opportunity there <laughs> all right let's we're, we're wearing that topic out let's move on to another one all right so is this is this specialization we're seeing this heavy specialization strictly for marketing and advertising purposes or is this differentiation actually helping joe average rider so let me give you a specific example um i'll, use, I'll pick on kawasaki for a moment because i think they have um divided the sport touring market into some really thin pieces of pie you've got the concourse you've got the versus 1000 you've got the ninja 1000 all these are some different mix of sport and touring kind of thrown into the same bike so i guess what i'm asking you is does that, you know, that segmentation, that slicing the pie into very, very thin pieces, does that help out the average rider? Or is it just so they can say, oh, no matter your flavor of sport touring, we can sell you something? I'd rather have less model options and a few more color options. <laughs> you don't like the FJR in blue only? That's I mean, not, like, certain, uh, we have a thousand <laughs> different bikes, a thousand different models, and they each come in one color. So uh, now, now in f in fairness, I will I will say you just you just hit on something I think is actually kind of important because always. well I I worry sometimes too that this some of this hyper segmentation may have come about from the internet echo cham chamber. Mm -hmm. Someone says, well, I want this bike, and it has to have this and this and this, and they have a laundry list of requirements, right? And everybody jumps on board, and everybody goes, yeah, yeah, I would totally buy that bike, absolutely. And, and then they then, don't. Well, exactly. And then they make the bike. Somebody makes the motorcycle, mm -hmm. and then the internet comes up with the weirdest reason to not go purchase it. Well, and, this and is like... You, but you just, like the, the, I'm thinking in the automotive world, the, the BRZ and the FRS, you know, those the, the Toyota mm -hmm. Subaru thing? That was the perfect car. The internet said for years they wanted that car, right. and then somebody went out and actually made it. They were like, oh, it doesn't come in the color I well, want so to buy. <laughs> this is like that episode of uh, of The Simpsons where Homer finds like the long lost relative who's like an executive at like GM or whatever, and they invite Homer as the everyman to come in and design the car, and they spend months and all the resources designing this car, and then they release it like the Detroit Auto yeah. Show. It's got like a bubble on it, and like it's like the most ridiculous car, and the company goes out of business because they right. listen to everything mm -hmm. that this person says that they want, and they put it on there. And I do think you're right. I think that the internet is really saying, no, if we have this, I would buy it. If we have this, I would buy it. Right. Realistically, like there's so many great motorcycles out there, like you can have a lot of fun on picking that one and then fine tuning a little bit to what you want. Do I think that the that the average rider benefits from something like again back to your example with Kawasaki, having the Versys or the Ninja or the the Concourse? Uh, I think we're getting to a point now where we are seeing that pie split <laughs> pretty thin. Very thin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Too many thin pieces. pieces. Uh, Okay, so now, now, unfortunately, now for the want want question, the sad trombone. How does this increased specialization affect a motorcycle market that is eff effectively in a, in a bit of a decline? Um, it is a bike that can handle a lot of situations a blessing or a curse from riders. I'm thinking specifically, you know, you and I have talked about, uh, you know, over the years. I think, um, you know, I'm I'm definitely a proponent of multiple bikes, multiple jobs. You're the, you're the job. yep. You're the Swiss Army knife guy. I think. Well, and first I, of all, I was the Swiss. I'm the Swiss Army guy because yeah. I don't have the kind of money that you have. I mean, you're oh. sitting there buying motorcycles and just like throwing that coin out there, and I'm just over here, nice when and you humble. Buy no, when you buy nothing but crap, you can afford a lot of motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> I think that honestly, you know, one thing to consider is I think it's kind of 
messing up the dealer. You know what I mean? Because now the manufacturers are like, okay, well, you have to have at least a couple of every model that we sell on, on your floor. sales floor. And we sell, you know, a hundred different kinds of motorcycles now. So your dealership <laughs> has to be as big as a supermarket. Yeah. And then, okay, well, the bikes are only valid for 10 months or whatever. You know, once they come out, they uncrate them, they put them on the floor. Oh, well, now you're going to have to start blowing them out at cost. So it's like, I think it really puts the dealer against the wall. Whereas like, if you think back to the sixties, walking to a Triumph dealership, you had a, you know, 500 or a 650. So, um, I think it also makes it really hard f because of the, the lack of support. And I mean, sales haven't been great. So I think it's really hard to find educated, you know, sales staff at dealerships. I think some of the owners are really struggling to find people that want to come in and work and, and know the product and, and to really know when you're looking at a manufacturer, again, look at Honda. I, I can't even, like I said, they just have 12 or 13 bikes that are under 500 cc's, let alone all the bikes that they have over 500 cc's. So unless these the this, sales this staff has the time and the resources to go out and ride all these bikes and understand all these bikes and be able to explain the differences to the consumer, I think the consumer gets overwhelmed and confused because there's no one there to educate them on like, oh, well, this is why you would go with this one, or this is why you would go with this I think one. You're selling, I think you're selling a consumer short. I think, I think consumers are pretty smart. I think people are, are usually... I have, I have worked the dealership floor, and we would have people come in, and they just want a motorcycle. They don't know what they want. They're looking at that over there and like, oh, I want that. That's a Jixer. But is that... And I'm like, no, that's a Ninja 636. And like, no, that's a Jixer. Because in their mind, like, right. that's, that's what but is looks that like what they is want. Is that representative of most... I feel like that's probably not a, rep a good representative customer. My, I, I, I wonder with this whole thing, to be perfectly frank with you guys, if this also doesn't help sort of fatigue the customer. I, I Like, I wonder if you're oh, wearing yeah. out a customer's wallet. Like, I'm thinking about, so we'll go back to new dirt bike purchases. Now I get to do it. Um, but, the, you know, in, in 17, I, I bought a new dirt bike. Um, and to your point, I had the dealer fit it with, you know, just some silly stuff. If I'll be, I'll be hundred percent honest. I'll lay my cards on the table here after just some light modification on this thing. Plus the cost of the bike, blah, blah, blah. I was knocking on the door of five figures. We're talking almost 10 grand for mm -hmm. a friggin' toy. This is like, I have a plate in my dirt bike. I think you guys have plates in your dirt bikes, but let's, let's be honest here. We're not riding these things in the street. No, these no. are the, yeah. like, I no. can't even get on my bike and take it to work without wanting to be completely miserable. I bought this very, very specialized piece of machinery. You guys have done the exact same thing sure. and that can't do anything else very well at but all. But it's so good at doing what it's supposed to do. And I, I'm not taking away from that at all. But what I was going to say was kind of step back to what you were talking about before was, oh, I took a street bike and I made it, you know, I made it so I can use it off road. I, you almost have to wonder if the customer's wallet doesn't feel a little less fatigue at that point because you buy a CL450, you know, way back when. It was easy enough to change the sprocket and change the, you know, change the, but you didn't even, you really need to change the pipes, yeah. change the sprocket, change the tires. Now you're back into a street bike. But I think the people that were, I think the people that were getting into motorcycling back then had a little bit more mechanical knowledge. I think mechanical mm -hmm. knowledge in society was a little bit more prevalent back then than when we have today. Well, but I mean, ch changing a set of tires in this sprocket is certainly something a dealer could do too but my point was more because there wasn't this rapid prolifer prol proliferation of machinery uh, you could be sort of competitive if you were on sort of a Joe yeah, but every you couldn't bike. expect you couldn't expect you weren't taking that bike back to the dealership to have that swapped out every time you were doing that yourself it becomes cost prohibitive to take if, if, if I if I were to buy a motorcycle and have two sets of wheels for it and I would just take that back to the dealership every time to have the dealership swap that out because I'm not mechanically inclined like that gets really expensive and cumbersome and now I need to have a truck. I need to have a way of getting that back and forth. Whereas I think to, to, to your extent, to, to what you're trying to say, I think that that can become cost prohibitive. However, there are a lot of motorcycles today where you can still have that same experience. So you're, you're saying you should just buy two bikes. No, 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 no. I'm <laughs> saying, I'm, no, I'm saying, uh, no, I, I, I think that, I think that you can get away with buying one motorcycle as long as you're okay with the fact that like you're not going to go do crazy dirt bike stuff, you're going to ride a little bit more gently off road, or you're not going to like tour in the utmost of comfort. You're going to sacrifice a little bit of comfort while you're touring. You're not going to be taken in the bike to drag knees on the track, but you're going to be able to ride pretty aggressively on the street. Like it depends on if you want to go do a track day or you want to go ride, uh, you know, off road hardcore. Then yeah, you're going to need a specialized machine for that. But if you just want to dabble in a little bit of all this, you just want to get out and have fun it's a pretty good time to be a motorcyclist. I think for a new rider, you just need to kind of link up with some other riders and, and educate yourself on what kind of riding you want to do first. Then that narrows down your selection to a reasonable number of bikes. But to I choose think from. that's hard. So I do. I, I know you want to ask the last question. I see your last card there. But like, <laughs> but that statement right there is something that we we really kind of glossed over. Like to ask people that have never been exposed to motorcycles before to just link up with some other riders. That's 
that's really hard to, to do. Like, unless you know someone area. that rides a motorcycle. I mean, it, we, we're lucky enough to be in a pretty populated area where you could get with a riding club or riding group or get on a forum or something like that and then get hooked up with a demo but we, day. But we're also motorcyclists that know that, right? So I think if you're, if you're someone that has never been exposed to motorcycles before to walk in and just say, hey, I would like to try and, and, and do this, it can be really, really intimidating. Mm-hmm. And, and even finding some other people that know the ropes a little bit can be intimidating. Yeah, I agree And I think that. that's what we should really be trying to find a solution for is like, how can we make this barrier of entry a little bit more accessible? Yeah. I mean, we try to do it with articles and videos and stuff, but like just figure just from, out what kind of riding you'd like to do and yeah. then go from there. But I think I think it becomes a little bit of everybody, every motorcyclist out there job to try and, you know, spread the gospel a little bit and like get people to understand what two wheels can be. Now Fair I'll enough. let you ask your last All right, let's <laughs> let's close this thing out, and put her to bed. Um, now, of course, as we reach this point, let's let's look forward a little bit. Can can you guys describe what you imagine is going to happen in the future in terms of specialization or or perhaps a lack thereof? Um, are we going to see this this trend of hyper segmentation continue further, or are we actually going to regress into maybe less specialized models, or maybe uh, you know the do all motorcycle becomes just a little bit more capable in every area? I think that you know if we look back. Obviously, that's a way to tell how the future is going to go. They've never cut any models, really. They keep adding and adding and adding and segmenting and segmenting and making all these different kinds of displacements and engine mm-hmm. layouts and watch all these out, things. Watch out for the Metric Cruiser segment. I think you're going to see that shrink and dwindle. Yeah, but I don't think it's ever going to go away. You know, I, I think that the type of motorcycles will still be available and the types will keep growing and growing. And then also... In 10 years, they're going to be electric versions of everything. We're already seeing electric sport bikes, electric dirt bikes. So uh, once that really starts to take off and the prices come down. Is that a separate segment or is that just a separate drivetrain? I mean, it's like, you know, if you're buying a pickup truck, you're going to get a gas or a diesel. It depends on what you're talking about, right? It's not separate. If you're looking looking at that, it's like, oh, well, I'm going to buy the supermoto version of the electric bike or I'm going to buy the sport electric. Um, I think you make a really great point with the Metric Cruiser. I think that'll slowly go away or morph into something a little bit more universal. Or at least just just winnow down. I just think you'll have the the same variety of choices you have now. But I think think to see financial success, you have to, you're going to have to see some some shrinkage to, to, because there's just so they're diversifying so much now the one thing that we really haven't brought up and you've brought this up numerous times one of the reasons this is successful for oems is because of the, the platform model right so one of the things that you've preached very um eloquently is you know with these bikes that you have Amazing. you know the same engine the same frame the same you know the same overall layout you change a few pieces you can make, make it look completely different but you're not investing a ton more and that's where i think a lot of these oems have seen success is they're using the same components across multiple lines to give people a bit of a different style and flavor i think mean, I mean, yeah i think that page was borrowed right out of the automotive industry's playbook but um but yeah, i think it, I, I, bet I, I think it works cuz you know you know that it's an emotional reaction if you walk in and you see something you like you're more likely to put your dollars down for it than if you yeah, walk in and you're like i ah, hate the way that thing looks but really want to ride a motorcycle so I guess I'm stuck with this. So I, I think, uh, for whatever it's worth, I, th- I think that whether or not we see continued hyper-segmentation or perhaps uh, a regression into maybe just fewer choices, it's really going to have a lot to do with sales, future sales. Um, you know, obviously, if motorcycles become, you know, a, a boom time, if we hit, we hit good times once again, I think you're going to see crazy hyper isn't that, isn't that trademarked by Kawasaki? Can we say good times? Isn't boom, that? Boom times. Oh, no, boom, boom, boom times. times. Okay. Boom times. Different. Like, you know, when, when, when you find gold in them Nar Hills. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, but if, if, if things kind of decline and start to slide, I mean, it's just going to make sense. They're going to have to consolidate things down quite a bit. Um, well, fellas, I think, I think we may have covered it. That's, I think we have completely hashed out segmentation. We've discovered, yeah. we, we've discovered absolutely nothing new. Um, <laughs> you, you've just kind of ended it there. They're on a pretty like ominous, like it depends on the future. But, but that's, uh, and no, that's th- all the time we have for today, ladies well, and gentlemen. No, there, I mean, there, 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 you know, certain, certainly there could be an increase, I think in sales. That's a, that's not outside the um, the realm of possibility. But I mean, I, I mean, really, it's not even that big a development, right? All I'm telling you is that if, if there's a bunch of motorcycles and more people buying them, then great, they're going to make more stuff. And if there's not that many people buying them, they're probably not going to make any different <laughs> types like of motorcycles. I'd like to see, you know, it, hopefully some folks will leave some comments about maybe different um, perspectives, like from a new rider's point of view, if you went to go shop for a new bike and then saw all these crazy segments and all these different options, were you just overwhelmed and, you know, took up knitting or, you know, or, uh, yeah. you know, super racetrack guy went into, uh, you know, the dealership and, and w- couldn't decide between a, 
uh, hyper sport or a super sport. You know, like it's just madness. I'd also like to hear back uh, about, you know, again, in the comment section about um, the dealership experience in your neck of the woods. What are the dealership experiences that you're having? Um, I think it's very dependent on the area of the country in which you live. So I would actually like to, to hear feedback from you guys as to, you know, what your experiences are like with certain dealerships. Indeed. And for those of you working for the OEMs who've been watching, we will send you an invoice for our consultation <laughs> and services. Just keep an eyeball on the mail for expensive. those. <laughs> that ought to do it. I think uh, don't forget to check this out on a podcast if you're looking for it. For Spurgy, for Joe, and myself, Lem, we're out of here. Are you trying to race Sunday? You want to race dirt bikes on Sunday? What race is Sunday? Stump jumper. Ooh, I heard that one's pretty wild. Well. Who wants to race motorcycles at a not wild race? A lot of stumps to jump.